Okay, thank you all for joining and welcome. Uh, welcome back or welcome for the first time if you're attending Member Spotlight. Um, this series was implemented by the ASBMR Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee and aims to highlight the research of ASBMR members within a collaborative setting and aims in particular to shine a light on the research being done by ASBMR members belonging to groups historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Today's spotlight will have two presenters. First, we have Dr. Mary Beth Humphrey from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center who will present mesenchymal stem cell differentiation in regulated by primary cilia. And second, we'll have Dr. Julie Paik, assistant professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital who will present on the association between sleep domains and risk of hip and vertebral fractures in the nurses' health studies. I'd just like to remind our presenters and attendees that each presentation will take approximately 20 to 25 minutes. And then following the presentation, there will be an opportunity for open Q&A with the audience. Um, so please just remember to keep yourself muted until um, after the presentation, at which point feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or um, ask questions using the Q&A feature or the chat. So with that being said, at this point, I would like to event, invite Dr. Humphrey to go ahead and begin her presentation. All right, so um, see if I can share my screen. <clears throat> so you need to stop sharing yours for me to, okay, there we go. All right, can you guys see that? Years. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to move it's on my other screen. So I'm going to move over here. Better. Okay. So uh, it's my pleasure today to talk uh, to to be one of the first in this series. Um, and I'd like to share with you. So I'm a, a rheumatologist. I'm the associate dean for research uh, at University of Oklahoma Health Science Center, and I have a R01 funded lab that works on. Um, a variety of different myeloid cells in disease states, one of which is osteoporosis or bone remodeling or osteoarthritis. And today I'll tell you about a project that we've had developing over the last couple of years um, that I'm hoping will turn into giving us a mechanism for how to make more robust mesenchymal stem cells uh, or potentially impacting PTH signaling. So, um, why is it not advanced? Oops, okay. So um, I'm just start with the acknowledgements. Uh, so there's a graduate student in my lab, Jeremy, who's done the flow cytometry I'll show you. Camille Heron did all the micro CT. Marta Onapuik is now a staff scientist in the Siokas lab, which uh, is a shared lab with mine. Uh, and she uh, did a lot of the uh, initial studies um, that I'll present very briefly. So what is a cilia? So a cilia is, a primary cilia is on uh, virtually every cell in the body. Um, it's like a flagella. It's got a variety of, um, you know, it's got microtubule structure in the middle. Um, and then it's got a variety of receptors, of um, uh, and calcium channels, one of which we'll talk about today is TRPSI1, a whole, whole variety of different uh, uh, receptors here. And so you can think about this as a major organelle for sensing chemical ligands, mechanical forces, fluid shear stresses, et cetera, temperature. Um, and um, it will organize and amplify those signals uh, as related to a lot of the uh, signals down here, hedgehog signaling, um, um, G protein coupled signaling, Wnt signaling, calcium, et cetera. So the reason our lab got it got it interested in this is that Leo Chokas, my uh, collaborator, uh, works on stem and RI. Stem and RI are two proteins. Uh, RI is on the extracellular membrane. Uh, stem is on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And these two um, proteins come together when there is some kind of a signal that activates, uh, that's going to lead to activation of calcium flux. So the endoplasmic reticulum uh, membrane protein moves up and and connects with the extracellular membrane that allows for lots of calcium flux uh, and, uh, and then will lead to depletion 
of intracellular stores, which then have to be uh, um, uh, re, uh, re, refilled. So there are many disease states where this complex or proteins that associate with this complex are abnormal, one of which is severe combined immune deficiency. So that is uh, mutations in stimuli that lead to inability of the T cells and the immune cells in the body to develop because they can't generate enough calcium flux. There are gain of function mutations where you actually have too much calcium going all the time. And then there's loss of function um, mutations, or, or uh, in this case, gain of function of ORI, um, which uh, leads to inappropriate calcium flux. And so um, these changes uh, can be seen in many disease states, one of which is a disease called Stormorgan. And it is a gain of function and leads to a variety of different pathologies, including some thyroid hormone pathologies. Because of this, we wondered whether or not Tripsy, which is actually a protein that associates with Orion stem as shown here in the channels that Tripsy1 um, uh, will couple to, it couples to lots and lots of, of receptors. It leads to lots of intracellular and couples to intracellular receptors. Tripsy1 is one of a very large family of calcium channels. It's got anchor and repeats, it's got a stem binding domain, uh, and it's got a pore here that allows for uh, ions, uh, cations to pass. So um, we wondered whether or not um, Tripsy1 by interaction with stem and, and ORI might um, play a role in G protein coupled receptor signaling. We knew that it does that with others. And just to remind you, when a G protein coupled receptor sees its ligand, it activates G proteins. We get PL PLC gamma activated, which then leads to both you know, DAG um, activation, calcium influx, um, and you get both receptor mediated calcium influx as well as store operated calcium influx so that you get a big calcium uh, load intracellularly. Uh, at the same time, the IP3 comes down and activates the ER, which sends all of the stored calcium in, which gives you that big robust calcium flux. So, um, and then uh, once that the store depletion is completed, STEM will then couple with, with ORI and refill the coffers. So we took Tripsy deficient mice that had been generated uh, by a global deletion and evaluated them for a variety of different um, hormones and found that they actually had significant elevations of serum PTH compared to their wild type litter mates or their heterozygous uh, litter mates. So that they had a high PTH and coupled with that was hypercalcemia compared to the wild type mice. So these mice looked like a model of primary hyperparathyroidism. So when we did further studies, and all of this was done by Marta, uh, we determined that the parathyroid gland actually expresses a lot of trypsy as seen in this immunofluorescence, uh, and the trypsy knockout parathyroid gland had virtually no trypsy. And if we took these uh, glands out ex vivo, so we took them out of the mouse with the help of Wen Han Ching in um, UCSF, he came and taught our lab how to do it. Um, so we removed these four glands, we could float them on a little bit of media, and then we could stimulate them with increasing doses of calcium and sample that conditioned media they were sitting in to get the excreted, um, secreted PTH. And you can see that the Tripsy knockout glands had a significantly more robust PTH response to even low dose calcium than the wild type glands. Um, and then if we actually looked at the set point, which is the, the point of which um, the calcium is um, that you get calcium flux. Um, the, the set point for the wild type was around one, which is a, a very typical set point, whereas the calcium set point for, um, for the PTH uh, suppression was uh, 1.2, 1.3, which was significantly shifted to the right, indicating that these glands um, uh, were abnormal in their PTH responses, in their calcium responses leading to abnormal PTH. So, um, so then, so th that created this model where uh, we 
suggested that the calcium sensing receptor, which is what senses the extracellular calcium, would be interacting with TRPSI. And the calcium sensing receptor normally will, when it sees calcium too high of extracellular calcium, it'll suppress PTH. And this mechanism has not been known how you can suppress PTH in response to high calcium. So we postulated that TRPSI was in there. And indeed, we went on to show that TRPSI is in there. And that um, in a paper that we published in JCI Insights last year showed that basically TRPSI um, can um, amplify the signals, the calcium signals needed to suppress PTH suppression. Um, and uh, that it also does this in terms of osteoclastogenesis, uh, which we won't talk about today. So our hypothesis was that because these mice were hyperparathyroid, we would have expected them to have an osteoporotic phenotype. Well, when we looked at both male and female mice, this is just the male mice, but it's representative of the female mice as well. They had an increased bone mass, BVTV, with increased connectivity, as you can see by the 3D reconstructions, increased trabecular number, thickness was about the same, and spacing was decreased, as you might expect when you have increased um, uh, uh, trabeculi. And when we did histomorphometry, uh, we were actually surprised to find that there was a significant decrease in the number of osteoblasts per surface area, um, but that the um, dual labeling showed that there was a similar um, 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 mineralization, mineral apposition rate and bone forming rate. Um, and when we actually looked at the histomorphometry, you can see nice big cuboidal osteoblasts here in the wild type mice, but, it, but you really only saw almost these very small, uh, thin osteoblasts, more like lining cells in the uh, TRPSI knockout mice. Um, the osteoclast numbers were reduced, but not significantly so. And then when we uh, looked at these mice over aid over time, we actually found that they were highly protected from age associated um, bone loss. So here's your tripsy wild type or the wild type mice that have you know few trabeculi. Uh, and remember, these are on a 129 background. So a normal a normal bone density for a wild type male is around 20%. So by 19 months, they've already decreased significantly, whereas the TRPSI knockout mice still have a profound amount of bone uh, as seen by the rest of these um, indicators. So that led us to look to say, well, what might be going on in the bone? And uh, in the serum about bone markers, we found that the TRPSI mice had decreased hydroxyproline, so they were not um, resorbing as well. They had decreased calcitonin. Uh, they had increased rank ligand, which would go against uh, having decreased resorption, and they had increases in FGF23. So if you compare that to human primary hyperparathyroidism, you expect increased rank ligand and FGF23, which these mice had, but you also would expect increased hydroxyproline. And then some patients have increased calcitonin, some don't. So it's hard to interpret this. So this wasn't completely mimicking uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. When we looked at the osteoclasts, uh, they actually had normal osteoclast uh, differentiation. They had normal osteoclast uh, actin rings. They had normal osteoclast resorption pits on both uh, uh, calcium phosphate substrate as well as on dentin. Uh, and you can see that the quantification was very similar. But when we re removed primary osteoblasts from Calvaria, we found that the uh, TRPSI knockout cells compared to the wild type cells had very accelerated um, osteoblastogenesis with mineralization as seen here with the lizard red staining. Uh, and when we looked at the conditioned media, they had increased osteocalcin compared to TRPSI knockout mice. So then, whoops, I think I've, um, so we also, um, uh, isolated mesenchymal stem cells and found that they had increased uh, adipogenesis as well. So this is day seven of uh, adipogenic media and three different mice. And you can see that they had uh, increasing uh, adipocytes. I'm sorry, it's a low magnification, but when quantified over here, you can see that they had a significantly increased adipocyte counts compared to the world type litter mates. So then we asked, do they have similar numbers of um, similar numbers of um, 
mesenchymal stem cells. And so we did a flow cytometry uh, where we uh, isolated bone marrow uh, out. We got rid of the bone marrow. We degraded the bone with uh, serial um, uh, calcium and EDTA and collagenase. And then uh, we uh, looked at uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And so we gated out all of the, um, I'm sorry, my, you're right, we gated out all of the um, CD45 um, positive cells, TER119 positive cells, because those are going to be hematopoietic cells and other kinds of cells. And we just looked at this population here. And when we then um, uh, did flow cytometry for PDGFR and for SCA1, which are um, markers, you know, there's a variety of different markers that can be used, but we decided to use these markers. You can see that um, we had this box that my pointer doesn't want to go to, <laughs> had increased mesenchymal stem cells compared to, or uh, this is the gate that we used for the mesenchymal stem cells. And so when we um, actually quantified that, we looked at both male mice and female mice and the male mice are on the left. And you can see that they had very similar non-significant differences in mesenchymal stem cells, but the females had a significant increase in mesenchymal stem cells um, compared to the wild type litter mates. When you looked at both populations together, there was quite a spread, but there was no significant difference. However, when we, and then when we took those mesenchymal stem cells and put them in colony forming units, and these assays are basically where you take 50,000 cells, 100,000 or 250,000 cells, and then you uh, leave them in um, osteogenic or not osteogenic, but mesenchymal stem cell media, um, and you uh, can look at them at various days. And so uh, we did this, wild types on the top, trypsin knockout is on the bottom. And then the quantification is uh, of the 50,000 and 100,000 is here on the uh, right. And you can see that there was no significant difference. So although we were seeing increased adipogenesis and increased osteoblastogenesis, we didn't really see a significant difference in colony forming units. The, the girl mice, female mice had increased um, uh, uh, HSCs or mesenchymal stem cells, but that couldn't account for all the findings we were finding for both the male and female mice in vivo, in vitro. So then we uh, did a mesenchymal uh, stem cell proliferation assay and BERDU um, incorporation and found that, uh, that there was decreased BRDU in our TRIPSI knockout um, mesenchymal stem cells. And that when you looked at PDGF um, signaling induced proliferation, the wild type cells had a very robust proliferation, dose dependent proliferation, whereas the TRIPSI knockouts had, had a very subdued, they did proliferate more, but it was very subdued compared to, uh, compared to the uh, wild type. So what we found is that um, TRIPSI is required for normal bone homeostasis and for age-dependent bone loss. Um, that TRIPSI negatively regulates osteoblast and adipocyte uh, differentiation uh, and that it regulates MSC numbers in female mice but not male mice. Uh, and that it is uh, required for MSC proliferation at least induced by PDGF. So our really our future plans uh, that are ongoing are we we're making a PRX1 CRE TRIPSI knockout mice cell conditional cell specific so that we can really see what TRIPSI is doing in mesenchymal stem cells in vivo. And then we're, we're really trying to determine the mechanism by, with, by which TRIPSI inhibits osteoblast and adipocyte differentiation and promotes proliferation. And, uh, and then uh, as a uh, bone regeneration project, we're looking to see whether or not our uh, TRIPSI knockout uh, mesenchymal stem cells can promote bone healing of a critical bone defect better than wild type cells. Uh, and then we'll look for specific inhibitors of TRIPSI or look for the, if we can determine the mechanism, I hope that we can find something more specific than TRIPSI to inhibit along the pathways. Other projects that are ongoing with this are really, can TRIPSI, because these mice are hyperparathyroid, um, but don't, 
don't ma they're manifesting more of the anabolic response to um, PTH. Is Tripsy part of that switch for how you can get PTH as an anabolic response versus a catabolic response? And so we have some studies ongoing about that as well. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Um, those are interesting data. Um, I had a question about that. When you mentioned that these animals are show signs of hyperparathyroidism, so the, the levels of serum PTH that you're observing, do they fluctuate or are they pretty consistent or pretty stable throughout the day? They're pretty, um, so all of these were drawn at the same time. So we tried to make sure that we were drawing calcium and PTH, all of our hormones things at the same time of day for all the mice to take out some of that diurnal uh, variation. But that's a, okay. that's a very good point. Okay. Do you but think they, they, if, they did notice this at multiple time points in their, you know, in their life, you know, we checked at various ages, various ages, but usually you try to do the draw at the same time of day. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think would happen if you kind of did several draws throughout the day? Would you think that you would see fluctuations in PTH and maybe that mimics like the intermittent intermittent treatment of PTH? That's a good thought. Um, I, 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 I don't think so, but we would have to actually test that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that the intermittent PTH, you know, especially now that we know that just, you know, giving it even once a week can get an anabolic effect, um, that, there's, that there's something about that big dose that probably is inducing some kind of big signal, you know, that we haven't yet been able to really capture compared to the other studies, you know, when we're doing long-term PTH signaling. And so they're, they're um, I think we, we need to really look at the mechanism there. Okay. And you, you had also had some data about um, with the TRIPC deficiency, TRIPC1 deficiency, um, accelerated osteoblast maturation. Do you think right. that is, how do you think that plays into the bone phenotype? Yeah, so, um, so that's a good question. What we haven't done yet is done tunnel staining of the cells and look at apoptosis. Um, you know, it's hard to look at apoptosis in vivo, I mean, in vitro with these assays, because once they've become mineralized like this, you know, it's hard to get rid of the mineral and look at the cells that are under that. Um, so I think we really, you know, the plans are to do uh, EDDU, EDU or um, BRDU in the mice and then repeat histomorphometry looking at um, uh, tunnel positive osteoblasts um, there to see if there's an effect. Okay, thank you. So I think they, I think they, may, they may generate faster because they don't go through as many proliferation states, which mm -hmm. is why we see this in, vivo, in vitro data. I think that once they get the signal, instead of going through multiple rounds of proliferation, they just go and then they were seeing mineralization faster, but that needs to be formally proven. Okay. Thank you for those questions. I know that was fast and furious, so. I have a question and there was very interesting data and I'm, you know, a little bit uh, uh, more focused on the biochemical data. And I was wondering whether you measure the levels of the 125 in circulation? It, we did, and it was normal. It was normal, okay. And yeah. what about the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, BUN and creatinine were normal, phosphorus was normal, all okay. the other. We rolled out all other causes of like secondary hyperparathyroid or secondary causes of hypercalcemia. Right, right. Now, yeah, because I was wondering whether the TR, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the TRPC1. Yeah, TRPC1, uh, yeah. TRPC1, and particularly in the kidney, if it's express, if it's expressed in some, you know, kid cells as yes. well. It is, it is. And, and so um, uh, it is, you know, we did, we did careful kidney function studies um, to make sure that there was no uh, abnormalities in the kidneys uh, or um, kidney function. Great, great. And, and finally, this is just a curiosity. I mean, have you measured sclerostin levels in the bone? I have not measured sclerostin levels in the bone. And that would be very, that, that's something we need to do. Thank okay. You. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
right. Well, if there's no other questions, I think we can move on to Julie and give her plenty of time to talk and have questions. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. your attention. Dr. Humphreys, um, yeah, Julie, if you wanna go ahead and <clears throat> start sharing your screen um, as soon as you can, that would be great. Mary Beth, yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to share um, some of uh, the ongoing research that we are doing using the nurses' health studies. Um, so this uh, is on our work on the association between several sleep characteristics and risk for vertebral and hip fracture in women. Um, just a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm a nephrologist by training as well as an epidemiologist. Um, and as well as a research scientist within the VA system at the New England Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center. So I have an interest in geriatrics and uh, geriatric nephrology also, um, in addition to bone and mineral metabolism and fractures. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, and so just as a little bit of a background, um, you know, during I became interested in studying vertebral fractures and risk factors for vertebral fractures during uh, my, my fellowship about uh, a decade ago. And because it is the most common fracture site in adults and it is so highly prevalent among postmenopausal women, and the incidence of vertebral fracture is rising, especially among older adults in recent years. I became uh, more interested in studying risk factors for vertebral fracture because there may be very different um, uh, aspects to it than for other fracture sites. Uh, for example, because of differences in the microarchitecture, uh, the biomechanics, the compressive loading geometry, and this concept of micro damage. And I heard about this concept of micro damage at an ASBMR conference years ago where Mitchell Schaffler uh, was speaking about this concept in bone. And I, I was really interested um, after he spoke about it and you know, thinking about it as it relates to vertebral fracture, just because it's such a trabecular rich metabolically active bone that is different from other fracture sites, let's say such as hip fracture. And the fact that most vertebral fractures are precipitated by routine everyday activities in contrast to hip fractures where there's this hard cortical shell and you know, most often it's related to falls. Um, and as I'll go into and describe in the ongoing work in the nurses health study uh, that I started in, um, in terms of understanding vertebral fractures as an outcome, we collected medical records and we've been doing that for many years I was struck by how the charts and even some handwritten notes by the nurses who have been participating in the nurses' health studies would mention that their fractures were not, well, some were due to slips and falls, others would be related to routine everyday activities like opening a window or lifting a grandchild and how that might've been you know, a precipitating factor that would be very different from what we would think about for other fracture sites. So that's partly why, why I'm, I'm very interested in studying vertebral fractures, not only from just the differences from other fracture sites, but also how uh, a lot of the participants, I've been struck by how it happened with just everyday activities and, and um, the interest in studying and how it is you know, occurring so highly among older women. So back to this concept of micro damage um, that Dr. Schaffler had spoken about before in one of his papers, he defined it as linear micro cracks and diffuse damage that accumulates with aging. And you know, in his, while well, he has a bioengineering background, you know, my interest is also in geriatrics and thinking about reserves that older adults have. And I think this process of um, you know, accumulation of micro damage and ability to withstand that also applies uh, here in terms of thinking about aging and, and the reserves to withstand that and how a certain routine everyday activity, while it might be innocuous for some, may be that last straw that sort of pushes the bone over the edge and no longer has reserve to handle that micro damage and thus results in a fracture. 
And here is his schematic where he presents these different concepts that we have to take into account in terms of understanding fracture risk, that there is the bone micro damage content that accumulates with aging and the ability of the bone to remodel and repair itself, as well as intrinsic properties of the bone, including bone toughness. And altogether, these concepts contribute to the idea of bone structural integrity and fracture risk. So taking into account this concept of micro damage that accumulates with, with aging, how does this apply to sleep? And why would we think about sleep and fracture risk? And within that framework that I mentioned earlier about micro damage accumulating with aging, you know, sleep has many restorative functions, including for bone. And I think we're starting to understand how sleep plays a restorative function for bone health. And here I present a conceptual framework for how alterations in sleep or circadian disruption could lead to an imbalance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts, such that the osteoblasts um, have an impaired ability to build and repair bone, um, build and repair that micro damage that might accumulate with aging. And because of that micro damage, um, that happens over time and its effects on structural integrity, it leads to the development of osteoporosis or directly to the development of fracture, thus leading to an increased fracture risk. So this is the conceptual model of thinking about how that alteration in sleep could lead to increased fracture risk. And digging a little deeper into thinking about what is meant by altered sleep. And so Daniel Bicey at the University of Pittsburgh presented this framework for thinking about sleep as multiple complementary dimensions, that sleep health has multiple domains um, that could influence it. And so thinking about sleep not as unidimensional, but that there might be multiple domains to understanding what constitutes good sleep, we set out then to study um, the association between self-reported sleep characteristics and risk of vertebral and hip fracture in the nurses health studies one and two. And we hypothesized that poor sleep characteristics as measured by these sleep domains would be associated with a higher fracture risk. So I'll explain a little bit more about the nurses' health studies for those who may not be familiar with it. So they are two ongoing prospective cohort studies. The nurses' health studies one began in 1976 and enrolled approximately 120,000 women who have been followed since with biennial questionnaires that ask them information about lifestyle, dietary uh, factors, medical conditions, medications, as well as chronic conditions over time. The Nurses Health Study 2 is a separate cohort of nurses, which began in 1989 and enrolled 116,000 female registered nurses. In addition to the questionnaires, information has been collected through uh, blood draws also, not on all of the nurses, but on a subset of nurses that have been archived and banked um, years ago, as well as other tissue samples, including urine, saliva, um, et cetera. And so the follow-up rate of the nurses is, has been over 90% of the eligible person time, and the cohort is predominantly white. So for, for this particular analysis of the association between the self-reported sleep characteristics and the outcome of hip and vertebral fracture, we looked forward from a baseline of 2001 in nurses two and then 2002 in nurses one. And so of the larger cohort, this study or this analysis includes about 120,000 participants uh, between nurses one and two. And uh, to be included in this analysis, information had to be available on both fracture history as well as self-reported sleep characteristics. And uh, nurses were excluded if they had a prior fracture um, at, at, compared to when, uh, the baseline period, which was 2001 or 2002 at either the hip, wrist, or vertebra. So we looked at four self-reported sleep characteristics. We looked at sleep duration, sleep difficulty, snoring, and excessive daytime sleepiness. 
So I'll go into each of these four. So for sleep duration, they were asked about total hours of actual sleep in a 24 hour period. And these self-reported answers have been correlated highly with sleep diaries that um, a subset of nurses had kept over a one week period and was also found to be highly reproducible over two years in that subset of nurses that completed a validation study on, these, uh, on the use of sleep duration in this questionnaire um, compared to sleep diaries. And in nurses one and nurses two, they were asked about sleep duration on multiple questionnaires. Um, and the, on the questionnaires, the number of hours of sleep were more granular than, um, than that used in this analysis. We harmonized the responses for the number of, of hours um, so that it was harmonized between the nurses one and nurses two and created five categories. For the question about sleep difficulty, nurses were asked about how much of the time during the past four weeks have you had difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? Um, and there were multiple responses and they were asked about this, nurses one in 2000 and nurses two in 2001 and 2013. And for the question related to snoring, they uh, had the option to respond across a gradation of responses. And they were asked about snoring on multiple questionnaires in both nurses one and nurses two. And lastly, about the question of excessive daytime sleepiness, nurses were asked on average, how often are your daily activities affected because you are sleepy during the day? And responses range from almost every day to never were the options that were provided to the nurses. So moving on to the outcomes. So the outcome of vertebral fracture, so this is clinical vertebral fr fracture that came to medical attention. And so nurses who self-reported a vertebral fracture on the nurses health study questionnaires, which we started asking about in 2012, um, we then sent a supplemental questionnaire to obtain additional information as well as permission to obtain medical records. So for those that we were able to review the medical, obtain the medical records and review the medical records, um, we, um, you know, we were able to confirm those. There were some that we were not able to obtain the records for, or where there may have been insufficient information in the records, or where nurses did not give permission to review the medical records. Less definitive reports were adjudicated by an expert. Um, and we excluded cases if they were due to high trauma, for example, um, you know, falling off a ladder, um, a motor vehicle accident, um, a horseback riding accident, rather than the, you know, the slip and fall types of um, cases. Uh, we also excluded cervical fractures and sacral fractures. For the outcome of hip fracture, we use self-reported hip fractures. In the Nurses Health Study 1, hip fra fractures have been queried about since 1982 and since then on every biennial questionnaire. And in Nurses 2, um, it, they've been asked about since 2005, every four years, and since 2013, every two years. Prior validation study within the Nurses Health Study 1 found that self-reports of hip fracture were found to be highly reliable. In contrast, when we conducted a validation study using vertebral fracture, even within the nurses, we found that actually the validation rates were not necessarily high enough to use the self-reports. Hence, that's why we went to using um, medical records for confirmation. So some of the covariates that we uh, included in our analysis are things that are available in the nurses' health study over time. So it's a very rich cohort that has been followed longitudinally, and it includes information such as lifestyle factors, light body mass index, waist circumference, physical activity, smoking status, alcohol intake, over-the-counter medication use, vitamin use, dietary intake that is assessed through semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaires, as well as um, use of postmenopausal hormone therapy. And in our analysis, we use Cox proportional hazards regression with updating of the exposure information. And we calculated person time of follow-up from the date of return of the baseline questionnaire to the date of either the vertebral or hip fracture diagnosis, death or end of the study time period. And for the analysis related to hip vertebral fractures, we censored participants if they developed a hip fracture during follow-up. For the analysis of uh, hip fractures, 
we censored participants if they developed a vertebral fracture during follow-up. So basically for the analysis, we censored those with the converse uh, fracture if they developed that during the follow-up period. Um, and of note, we also conducted some joint analyses. And this is because a biologically severe phenotype has, has been emerging that is of insomnia with short sleep duration, which is found to be a more biologically severe phenotype. And so we looked at um, the joint characteristic of sleep difficulty and sleep duration and its association with fractures. Also, we conducted another joint analysis that looked at two hallmark symptoms related to obstructive sleep apnea, that of snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness, and looked at their them as a joint characteristic and their association with vertebral and hip fracture as the outcome. So moving on to the results. Um, so overall, in terms of the baseline characteristics of the participants in nurses one and nurses two, we found this is one example, which we showed just based on uh, sleep duration. And we found that nurses who had shorter sleep duration were more likely to be non-white, a current smoker, and a never or past user of postmenopausal hormone therapy. I'll just point out here, I think you can see my, um, my arrow, that, oops, that uh, the nurses, in nurses too, they are younger uh, by about 20 years compared to uh, the participants in nurses, uh, the nurses health study one. And so the, for the analysis of the association between the sleep characteristics and vertebral fracture, over 12 to 14 years of follow-up, we had 569 incident vertebral fracture cases that were confirmed by medical record review, the majority of them being in Nurses Health Study 1 and about 160 in Nurses Health Study 2. And we found similar associations between Nurses 1 and Nurses 2. So I'll go through each of the, uh, the sleep characteristics. And so we found that for nurses sleeping less than five hours compared to the reference group of seven hours, there was an increased risk, a, a point estimate of 1.2 um, for those sleeping less than five hours. And for those sleeping more than nine hours compared to the reference group of seven hours was about 0.82. For sleep difficulty, when we compared the group that responded all the time versus none or little of the time, we found that the risk of vertebral fracture was increased um, at 1.6 um, for the group responding all the time uh, compared to those uh, responding none or little of the time. We found more pronounced results for snoring and the risk of vertebral fracture. For those reporting snoring every night of the week versus never or occasionally, the risk was uh, the, the, the hazard ratio was 1.47 um, with a confidence interval 1.05 to 2.05. And for excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, for the group responding daily versus never, it was an increased risk of vertebral fracture 2.2 um, for that group reporting a daily experience of excessive daytime sleepiness compared to none. So moving on, for hip fracture, in this analysis, we had about almost 1,900 incident hip fracture cases, about 1,500 in nurses one and 400 in nurses two. And we found similar associations between nurses one and nurses two. And, and thus um, in our pooled results, what we found though were slight increases in hip fracture risk, but no significant trends across the different sleep characteristics. Um, and for the most part, there were, uh, there were no significant um, associations between the sleep characteristics and hip fracture risk. Moving on to the joint sleep characteristics um, and their association with, hip, with vertebral and hip fracture. So the results are more pronounced for vertebral fracture compared to hip fracture. Compared to the results when we had looked at the individual sleep characteristics, when we looked at the joint characteristics of sleep duration and sleep difficulty, we found that those with sleep difficulty and more than six hours of, oh, sorry, sleep difficulty and less than uh, six hours of sleep had the, the highest risk in this group um, of 1.5 um, for this group of participants. 
And those still with sleep difficulty and greater than six hours of sleep also had an increased risk of vertebral fracture. And we really didn't see it as much for those um, without sleep difficulty. Then looking at the joint characteristics of snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness, we found that the association was strongest for those nurses who reported both snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, and even if they had only one of the two characteristics, the excessive daytime sleepiness or snoring, that they, it was also associated still with an increased risk of vertebral fracture. And so this just summarizes those joint characteristic findings that basically sleep difficulty was associated with um, either less than six hours or more than six hours of sleep. And that for the um, results for the joint characteristics of snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness, that uh, there was a 2.5 fold higher risk of vertebral fracture for those who had both characteristics but that the risk was also still increased for those um, with either of those symptoms. There are study limitations in this prospective observational cohort study. There is the possibility of residual confounding, um, also misclassification of our sleep characteristics as well as uh, of fractures. Um, it is a predominantly Caucasian study population, and we also do have some loss to follow up. Um, in our cohorts. So the conclusions from this work are that poor sleep as assessed by sleep duration, sleep difficulty, snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness were independently associated with higher risk of vertebral fracture, but our results didn't support an association with hip fracture risk. And this is consistent with uh, findings from prior studies in the literature that showed either um, uh, no significant association or just a very modestly increased um, in risk, increased risk with, with hip fracture. Um, this time, there are really very limited studies on the association between sleep characteristics and vertebral fracture um, in, in observational studies. And so I think our study highlights the importance of thinking about sleep as multiple dimensions. Oftentimes we'll see maybe one dimension, but um, I think thinking of this emerging framework of sleep having multiple dimensions and how might that be associated with the development of fractures um, due to potential different mechanisms, whether it's related to hypoxia, sleep fragmentation, inflammation, um, other uh, you know, circadian rhythmicity, um, different uh, aspects of sleep that could be related to different mechanisms in the development um, of fracture risk and its effects on bone health. And further research is needed on the role of sleep and bone metabolism in bone metabolism and health that may differ by fracture site, just because thinking about vertebral fracture, um, you know, it's a very trabecular rich and metabolically active type of bone compared to the hip, which is less metabolically active um, and more cortically rich. Um, and, and so thinking about how risk factors may differ by fracture site, as well as interventions that may reduce the risk of fracture that are related to sleep. And so I'd just like to thank the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 participants, as well as the collab collaborators on this work. Um, and this work was supported um, by uh, various uh, funding sources um, from different institutes amongst the different collaborators. Uh, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. That was really excellent. Thank you so much. <clears throat> As a rheumatologist, you know, we see a lot of vertebral fractures and treat a lot of osteoporosis. And as you know, um, with the, you know, um, the risks of osteonecrosis of the jaw and trochanteric femur fractures and uh, a lot of, um, misbeliefs of the public that are very hard. It's kind of like getting COVID vaccines. It's kind of hard to convince somebody that believes firmly that they should not take these medications. It looks like if we could just get them better sleep, we get a pretty good, a pretty good, um, you know, risk reduction of vertebral fracture. Um, so should we, I mean, it, it's, Obviously, we talk to patients about um, decreasing their computer time and screen time and sleep hygiene and things like that. But should we be promoting uh, 
sleep aid medications, you know, uh, non-addictive ones, you know, to help people get a better sleep for this indication? No, I think that's a great question. And so I think, you know, what this work is, is it's more, I think, um, hypothesis generating because, yeah. you know, it is an epidemiologic study. But I do think it raises questions because, you know, we did look at obstructive sleep apnea. And so that's more clinically severe phenotype, you know, clinically diagnosed. But here we were finding even after controlling for obstructive sleep apnea, that even snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness in and of themselves were associated with, with some increased risk here. Um, and so I, I look at this as sort of, you know, maybe potentially looking at um, having conversations with patients about sleep. Um, make, and, and I think there's some wonderful ongoing work. Um, I think Christine Swanson at the University of Colorado Denver, I remember hearing her give a talk at ASVMR a couple of years ago on her work on sleep. And I just found it really interesting what she was doing um, in terms of the research that, uh, on sleep, um, in terms of the, like the biomarkers and, and the uh, bone turnover markers that she's studying. And so I, I hope that you know, with complementary research that is ongoing in this field related to sleep and bone, we may have more answers um, in terms of what to recommend. I think at least getting a sense of whether, you know, beyond the scope of this study, you know, even do they snore or um, right. things uh, like, uh, you know, do they have excessive daytime sleepiness? Um, from a health standpoint, regardless, I think is, is just sort of helpful to, to query. So, I hope that this is at least sort of um, um, a, a hypothesis generating in terms of leading to more work in, in that area. Um, and in terms of the medications, you know, it, it's hard to say because I think it depends on what other medications they are. They're already on, right. We always have to do a risk benefit assessment. But, but given that, you know, I, I do think there's so much that is we think about sleep and the restorative functions of sleep. And I think there are restorative functions of sleep related to bone that we also need to understand too, that we are learning from, you know, from my studies, the basic science arena and the circadian rhythmicity knockout gene model, you know, models with this. And how does that factor in? Um, so, and so I became very interested in this when I had been reading about some of these, you know, gene knockout mouse models related right. to sleep rhythmicity, sleep fragmentation, and, and how might that play, you know, in an epidemiologic study? Um, so, yeah, very good. So do you think, um, I, I don't think you presented this data, but since there's a, an association between poor sleep and, and fracture risk, I imagine then there's association between poor sleep and osteoporosis. Um, do you have any data um, showing bone mineral density um, for these individuals? So that's one of the limitations of our um, of these cohorts. We don't actually have any bone mineral density tests. Um, we do have self-reported history of osteoporosis. And so in the analysis, I didn't show it, but we also had models in our analysis where we controlled for osteoporosis. But we were also concerned that we would be overfitting the models because of thinking about osteoporosis as a mediator on the pathway between sleep and the outcome of fracture. So we did look at the analysis between both um, that association with and without osteoporosis in the models. And we did find the association also there, including osteoporosis, but it was slightly attenuated. But that could also be just because of our understanding of the mechanism uh, or that we think of it more as a mediator along the pathway mm -hmm. um, and that our models may be overcorrecting for that in the regression analysis too. But it is a limitation. We don't have bone mineral density tests. In this analysis. And so what, what do you think the timeline is for this? So say for instance, I used to get good sleep and then now I've start developing some type of sleep issues or sleep difficulty. Would it take one year or two year for me to develop this association between uh, fracture risk and poor sleep? So the analysis that we did was over 12 to 14 years of follow-up. Um, and so the hypothesis is that, you know, we have micro damage that accumulates with time. And are there any factors that impair our ability as we age to repair that, that micro damage that accumulates, whether it is different risk factors or whether it's alterations in sleep or sleep fragmentation that happen over, over many, many years. Um, so I wouldn't be able to speak to at least short term things, but at least for this one, this was over the course of at least a decade in terms of the follow up period. Okay. 
And, and you mentioned like several mechanisms that may be responsible for this. If you were to pick one to start with, for, with your investigations, which would you choose? It's right. There's so, you know, so I think one of the more obvious ones would be the hypoxia, the nocturnal hypoxia, just because we see that so strongly with um, obstructive sleep apnea, hypoxemia studies, um, and you know how it also influences sleep fragmentation, um, and we're, you know we actually have you know overnight sleep studies that actually ha are able to measure nocturnal hypoxia over time. You know, and and that is something that could be corrected. Also, let's say if someone mm -hmm. did have a correctable condition, condition, a treatable condition like obstructive sleep apnea, snoring um, that led to excessive daytime sleepiness is also you know intervenable. Um, but I do think it is multifactorial that there are other things going on there in terms of the inflammation um, that's occurring, um, the, the metabolic, because it is metabolically active, um, paracrine signaling, all of these things I think are um, occurring uh, in terms of circadian rhythmicity also and how that might play into it. Um, so I would just say, you know, hypoxemia is an easier starting point because we can measure it mm. overnight with ethismography. Um, but I do think that there are multiple mechanisms likely contributing to this. Okay. And one of the things that, you know, came up while we were discussing about this, I mean, first of all, that was an excellent data. I actually didn't know about that, that association. And, and actually I was thinking about, well, if we, you know, make an intervention and recommending more sleep, that means spending more time in bed therefore less mechanical loading for the bones, less exercising or, you know, I mean, I was just thinking about the concept of being sleeping versus being, you know, resting or, you know, have you included some of the data uh, that portrays people that sleep less, but they are, you know, um, moving around or, or just, you know, sleeping less, but at bed. I mean, is that something that you consider in your analysis? All right, so, so we don't have information necessarily about moving. And so, you know, I think you, you raise a really great point. And I think what, you know, with this analysis, we are trying to get more at some aspect of sleep quality, meaning mm -hmm. it's not just the duration, right? But the thinking about that sleep has multiple dimensions. And it's not just that we lie in bed, but we have mm -hmm. good sleep. And what goes into what constitutes good sleep so that we can have the restorative functions, you know, sleep difficulty, um, being able, you know, snoring, excessive daytime sleepiness. And I'm sure there are other dimensions, but just to think about it more as it was, we don't look at it as just the, the length of time we're in bed, gotcha. but other dimensions going, go into having good quality sleep. Absolutely. No, yeah, I was thinking again, I mean, the mechanical loading is important, you know, for bone formation. And if, again, just there's, there's got to be like a threshold of, you know, time that we should spend at bed. Of course, you know, good quality sleeping as well, but there's a moment of, you know, it's going to start being a problem for the bone as well to spend that much. I don't know, just thinking out loud, I'm sorry. <laughs> and our results were actually probably the weakest for the sleep duration. It was actually more strong for those that were excessive daytime sleepers. So I think it really goes more to there's something about the quality of, of our Absolutely. Sleep. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. I know <clears throat> we had a couple of people that looked like they had to drop off a little early, but I did just want to take the moment to thank both Julie and Mary Beth for your presentations. They were great. Um, we will have a recording posted on the ASVMR YouTube channel. So if anyone who wasn't able to attend the session live is interested in hearing your presentations that will be available. And just as a reminder, um, we will have the next session on August 25th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're available to join, please feel free to do so. And um, we hope to see you then. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank day. you. Thank you.